Without further ado, please put your hands together for Evan. Hi. Hi, guys. <laughs> I might just stand. Sorry for being such a diva. Um, Do you want to move that out? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's morning. I, I just got in. What are we doing here on a Friday morning, <laughs> 8 30? Um, are you guys going to work after this or going to yoga or going home? What, what is the. Or is this an excuse to get away from work and just take a half day? Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Um, but thanks for coming. I'll try to make it worth a while. Um, yeah, my name is Irvin. So I'm, uh, I'm actually not an animator, right? I never went to animation or even art school, really, right? I, I went to, um, I studied uh, media and business. I did two years of film studies. That's, a, that's pretty much my background. So everything I, I know or learned or loved about animation was sort of uh, on the job. Obviously, it started with me growing up as a kid, addicted to cartoons, you know, as an 80s kid. Um, yeah, Saturday, I remember Saturday morning was Sesame Street and then Sunday morning was the big one. We start with, we had Smurfs and then we had like a Fraggle Rock or, or um, something like that. Um, but when I started the studio sort of 10 years ago, I, I've been in animation for about coming to maybe 19 years, right? Um, at one time I used to work for the MDA, the government, when they just started when they had a mandate to develop the industry. So I was tasked with helping to develop the animation industry. And then, um, and then I joined uh, a local animation studio for was there for about five, five and a half years. Um, before I left, I started my own company. Even before the MDA, I was, uh, my first job out of school was with uh, Singapore Telecoms. So I actually, at one point, I was a certified network engineer. Right, because I did a year of, uh, of postgraduate in telecoms management. This was during the late 90s when internet was booming, it was very interesting. But then, uh, yeah, corporate wasn't for me. You know, um, okay, I'm rambling, but I think in the morning I better show you something to wake you up. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to show a little reel of our company's work. I think that will give you a much better idea of the kind of work that Robot Playground does. Uh, we make cartoons, you know, in a nutshell, but we have a very specific interest and focus in sort of local and regional storytelling, you know. Um, I spent a good 10 years working on cartoons that, that are, they were ostensibly Western cartoons, right? Stuff we did for, stuff you see on Nickelodeon, on Cartoon Network. So when we started Robo Playground, what we really wanted to do was to use the craft, the knowledge we know to find our own voices and to help others find their own voices through uh, this incredibly frustrating storytelling medium called animation. Right. So I'll just show you a bit of work we've done. This is some, a quick nutshell over the last 10 years. Okay, the music was supposed to move you into, uh, but yeah. <laughs> That's fine. 
Yeah, so that sort of uh, gives you an idea of the kind of stuff we do. You know, we do 2D, CG, 3D, even stop motion. We both uh, produce in-house. We also produce for other filmmakers, other storytellers, right? And I think you can see a lot of the imagery there, you know, centers around Singapore as a backdrop. Right, or at least Asia. So that really is a big part of our creative drive. Um, we want to do something that, um, you know, not someone, a studio from the US, from Europe, you know, may not necessarily be able to, to do the, the way we do it. And I think that really comes from a certain kind of a, a voice and authenticity. At the same time, they have to be universal stories, something that not just Singaporeans or or Asians could, could relate to. It has to be universal at a very core emotional level. Right. So that's kind of what we do. Um, yeah, like say, I say, I, I didn't go to art school, right? Um, I grew up as a kid, 80s kid, you know, loving cartoons. Um, you know, the old, going back to the Flintstones even, I, I saw Flintstones on TV. So that's dating myself. And um, even like, um, um, of course, Looney Tunes, you know, Chuck Jones, Taxi Reed, the very classic cartoons. And then in the 80s, in my early teen years, it was boys action, right? You know, what's that like? Uh, He-Man, you know, Transformers. Oh my God, Transformers, the original, yeah. Um, and then the Disney specials. Back then, we don't have Disney Channel the way we have now, right? Um, every hall... Some of the major holidays, they would, they would run specials and would, I would record them on VHS, <laughs> VHS and you know, watch them on endless loops. Um, the first film I remember watching in my memory was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs uh, with my mother. Obviously, it was a re-release because that came out in the 40s. Right? And it, it was only in university when I discovered uh, the films of Hayao Miyazaki, right? Studio Ghibli. And that kind of changed something inside me in terms of what um, sort of animated film or filmic storytelling could be, right? Um, I remember I upset quite a, one or two of my film uh, lectures because uh, I, I studied in Australia, so we obviously study a lot of uh, great Australian uh, directors like Peter Weir and George Miller. But a lot of papers I wrote were on Miyazaki. So I said, why are you writing a cartoon? you know, for my paper on mise en scène or whatever, you know. Um, but that sort of changed how I looked at animated storytelling. And I think at that point, I knew that's something that I, I, I would want to pursue at some point in time. Because, you know, we grew up watching Disney cartoons, right? We have a certain idea of what a love story is, what a romantic story is, right? What a hero is. But what, you know, Miyazaki does with all those archetypes are completely different. Right. At the time, I didn't even really sort of understand um, why he told it this way. It was maybe years later that, that uh, you know, it came to me. So I would encourage, you know, for, for many of you, especially those with children, introduce them, you know, in, incorporate some of these early studio Ghibli films into your children's sort of uh, uh, consum media consumption. You know, they might not understand it today, but down the road, you know, they would. Okay. Very quickly, let me just go through some of the, yeah, some of these you've seen earlier, but uh, again, just an idea of the kind of, uh, uh, this love we have for local storytelling using animation. Not many people in Singapore do this, maybe for good reasons, because it's extremely difficult and sometimes quite thankless. Right, this was fun to do, was a 2021 NDP show film. This was directed by uh, Bu Jun Fong, a local filmmaker. Um, I really tried to convince him not to use animation because I just told him this is going to be a nightmare, you know. He has, you, you've never done animation, you know. Um, but he really went for it and it was really, really a wonderful experience working with him for over a year on this. And we did many short films. We've done about 12, 13 short films over the course of the last decade, right? Um, And then, yeah, this one, I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is currently on Netflix. Seasons one and two are on Netflix. Season three is on Me Watch. You know, um, it's basically just uncles and aunties behaving badly. <laughs> yeah, it's not for kids. I have friends who watch this and then they have to stop halfway and they have to call me. I say, do you look at the rating, you know? Because, yeah, it's 
it's uh so check it out if you can it's it's quite fun the entire cast are local right i think the main character is uh, mr brown you know the i shouldn't say blogger i don't know the word blog can still use it but uh, and then we have a lot of local comedians theater actors i, I use quite a lot of theater actors in my voice cast more so than uh, screen actors because i find theater folks and also even comedians they are more comfortable on stage they are more used to using a voice to project and to perform and their imagination right so um, this is a preschool preschool show that we did where's what uh, happened we actually did started this with a preschool children's app with a local uh, company called Tositala. we have vibe out here from there and then later on media Corp picked it up as an animated preschool series you know so we do preschool we do wholesome stuff, so I can do wholesome stuff also, really, yeah. <laughs> I can also do auntie-uncle sex jokes, and yeah. Uh, we do horror, also this is something in development, right? We are finishing a pilot exactly in a week's time. It's based on a book by an uh, American Chinese author. Uh, um, it's called A Banquet of a Hungry Ghost, right? It's the book title. And it's an anthology short film on episode. Each episode is based around a Chinese dish. So I don't know if you can guess this, but this is sweet and sour pork. Right. Now we have hot pot. Right. Uh, dumplings. Dumplings. Different kinds of meats. Yeah. Uh, long life noodles. This is the pilot that we're just finishing up. I, I don't know it will be released publicly. Right. But um, we spent one year just working on a 20 minute, uh, like a 17 minute episode. So it's, you know. Hopefully, some point get to see. We also adapt this as a book from a British author, Chris Bradford, who we're adapting into an anime adjacent series. Although we kind of have to go back to the changing board because of uh, this show called Blue Eyes Samurai, which is amazing. You haven't seen it, it's on Netflix, you should see it. It's R21, though, so again, make sure the kids are asleep. Um, and then we do kind of silly slapstick comedy, right? This is kind of like our version of Tom and Jerry. It's a space bounty hunter guinea pig who's trying to shoot down a hamster. We can't see it, but a hamster's got a birthmark on his backside, which is like a target. So that really pisses him off. So that's the premise. Sometimes cartoons don't have to be too complicated. It's really just, you know. Uh, over the years, you know, companies like Disney come to us to maybe use some of their classic properties to spin off into, to, um, um, you know, series that um, a little bit more local in flavor. So this is one of them we did a couple of, uh, a few years back. Um, it's done quite well, actually. It's, I think the Peranakan episode has something like 20 million views on YouTube. Uh, this is the most recent. It's currently on Cartoon Network YouTube channel. Tom and Jerry in Singapore, yeah, basically, you yeah. know. So even when we work with these big companies and very beloved uh, uh, vintage brands, I think the idea is always we have to be able to bring something kind of unique to it. You know? So very natural to many of these clients when they come to us is, can we set it in something that feels a little bit more local or regional? You know? um, uh, rather than just doing another series of Mickey Mouse shorts set in Paris or, or wherever. Again, I think there's been increasing amount of interest um, in Southeast Asia, in the Far East, you know, in a different way. The media landscape has completely changed over the last decade, right? Um, so hopefully that spells good news for content creators here. So this is something that's taking up most of my time right now. It's a, it's a feature film that we are producing. It's our first movie um, out of the studio, right? It's my first feature animation. I've directed maybe about a, a dozen short films. This is my first feature, right? I'm co-directing with a Spanish director. So this is a five country production, Singapore, Spain, uh, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Japan, right? Um, I think we're aiming for a late 2025 release. So we are currently in storyboarding stage about to start animation in uh, two or three months time. Um, I've got a little, and it's very much a, the, but I've always thought the first sort of feature 
animation out of our studio, it has to be a story about who we are, right? Where we come from. Um, so in a sense, um, we model it very much after like a European indie animated film. The budget's about just under four million US dollars. It might sound like a lot, you know, but it really is quite a modest budget in, 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 a, in, in the intent at the international uh, level. And it's about, it's about the entangled lives of two musicians growing up in colonial day Singapore. And then when the war came to Malaya in the late 41, you know, their lives take very different paths. You know, essentially, they go both ways. Uh, um, and you know, it, it is sort of a love letter to, to, to Singapore, but also to the shifting kind of destinies of Southeast Asia after post-war, where there's this wave of, of uh, uh, movement, you know, uh, social and political, you know, um, to to self-govern and this desire for independence. I have a little um, Caesar reel that I've done up. So this is something that is, I don't think anyone's really seen this. Yeah. I mean, the music is Vanesky's Violin Concerto, so it's not original. You know, but the soundtrack will be recording several you know, popular, well-known concerto pieces. We're actually composing an original violin concerto you know, for the film, because it is a central character in the film. Um, but yeah, this is what's giving me more stress now, probably for the next two years. Um, we are still looking for investors, if, if anyone is keen to, to, to have a chat. Um, I didn't mean for this to be a pitch, so actually I do. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, if anyone wants to talk to me about this, I'm happy to talk. So that's really just a very quick overview. I don't know how much time we have left. Um, I was told to kind of link my talk back to this idea of perspective. Um, I, I gave a very pretentious quote. <laughs> what yeah. What about the essay? Huh? Uh, I mean, perspective is obviously interesting. As storytellers, as filmmakers, um, you know, it all starts with a point of view, right? What's interesting is after the product or the film or the TV show is created, once it goes out there, it, it no longer belongs to us. You know, I think every, each and every audience member bring his or her own perspective. Um, and then, you know, whether the, the film is liked or not, or is, you know, controversial or not, you know, it depends on, I think that's really, in many ways, anything that is artistic in nature, you know, I think has that quality, like, you know, it, it really requires um, the, the input and the interpretation of, of um, um, an audience member to, to sort of uh, give it meaning. I mean, I know what many of our films mean to me, but what it means to others, I don't know, and I, I would actually be very interested to know, right? You know, even when we draw a storyboard, the first thing we draw often is a perspective lines, you know, you know, to, to sort of, uh, to guide the camera. So, yeah, I just thought uh, it's interesting that Gwen and team, you know, you know, gave me a call and wanted me to sort of talk about this. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have. Can I just stay for some questions? Hey? Yeah, uh, I'd love to take any questions you have this early morning. I think that's actually more a fun kind of a talk. Yeah, so uh, for anyone who was wondering, the so-called pretentious quote that Ovin gave us, which I actually genuinely really love, is, perspective is a house with many rooms and windows and basements. And it's true, I mean, in a, in a work like a cohesive film, you know, it, you're meant to look at it as a, as a, in its totality, but it's made up of all of these different components, right? Yeah, and I think it's a house that we continue to build throughout our lifetime, you know. So sometimes you build another basement, you, you have a bigger window, you have a smaller window, because I think you either look outward or you look inward, yeah. you know, for better or worse. And, you know, as your house gets bigger and bigger, hopefully it, it gives you a much more fuller uh, perspective on, on, on life, yeah. you know, and when we do stuff like this, really it's a, I'm not being sort of a, I'm serious, all this is a form of therapy. <laughs> when, you, when you make a film, when you do a TV show, yeah. when, when I do, when I write 30 jokes about uncle and aunties, everyone laughs. Something in me is like, a, it's quite cathartic, right? 
um, especially when the sensors pass it, right? Oh. You know, and then something very sort of a bit more serious, a more bittersweet, like the Vanellis film, is also something very much in uh, how how I look at uh, uh, um, um, stories at this point in my life. Yeah. I'm also actually very curious because there's both an artistic, when you run your own studio, essentially, there's an artistic element, then there's a commercial element to it, right? Where's the balance for you? Uh, I don't know where's the balance. <laughs> yeah, sometimes um, it's true, you know. Um, I mean, like I said, the, when, when, after we make a TV show or a short film or a film, once it goes out, there's nothing you can do. Right, so I tell my artists and my staff, you, we want to make a good product, right? Um, but it is actually more important that you enjoy sort of the journey, right? So that even if the film does really bad, whatever, commercially or whatever, you know, you have that, 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 that memory to, to treasure. Like, because it takes a long time in animation, right? Um, and then on the commercial side, Yes, there has to be a balance. I mean, we do many of this. I, I always say, in, for all of you, in, some of you in film, you know what I mean. You know, it's a very dysfunctional profession, right? Because you are essentially always asking people to give you money to make your dream project. I mean, in any other kind of, why, not, why would I do that? Why would I give my harder money to you so that you can live your dream? But it's what we do. Right. Um, every project, everything you see here had to be financed. Nothing really came out of our own pocket. I think that is something that I'm quite uh, a clear on from day one. You know, um, um, sometimes we go over budget, but sometimes that happens. But you know, we as producers as well. I'm I'm a producer. You know, it, so much of the work is really um, speaking to different people from different walks of life. Um, and trying to sell the project as something that they see value in from their own perspective again, yeah. right? And then hopefully they can, you know, if they're interested, they can contribute financially or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, people pay you because those are beautiful dreams that you have. So we're very, very happy. Yeah. We're very lucky to have your work out there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right, we're going to open it up to the floor for some questions. I'm sure there are quite a few from you guys. Uh, but as an extra little incentive, I have three ten percent off vouchers sponsored by Crane. So the first three uh, question askers will get one each. All right, who wants to get the ball rolling? And I'll, I'll bring the mic to you, hold on. Hi, well, thanks for this Hi. Um, interesting presentation. I really, really love what you're doing. Um, I'm a digital artist, and I would like to have your take on um, AI. <laughs> I mean, I suppose wow, it's, it's in a few years. 9 a.m., okay. I know. <laughs> so I got two for the tackle. I mean, um, I, I mean I, for myself, I went through a huge depression for six months. I didn't mm. uh, create anything once that took him out. But it's evolving, and uh, of course, even the movie picture is going to be soon um, possible just as a few prompts. Just want to know your, your take about it. Do you feel threatened by it, or do you embrace the journey of creation, or um, like are you planning to employ some of the tools, or just want to know your take on it? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have uh, a lot of emotions about it, right? As many people in our industry has over the last, even the last few months, right? When this sorrow just came out, you know, a lot of people, including our investors, started to call up, right? Um, I suppose that's natural. It's a bit knee jerk as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's so much discourse going on online about this. Um, as a as a business owner, right? And as a, I mean, the, the first and most important thing for us when I tell my staff is, you, you know, um, tools are tools. Right, we may, and in fact, we have already started to use a few, right? Um, mostly in the development and ideation process, right? So, for me, at least at this point, what the artificial intelligence has to do is to do something that because you know, you can we can easily talk about one 
the AI too could replace 10 artists, right? So the way I look at it is it has to do something that even the 10 artists couldn't do. You know, I think that's the definition of sort of a, a really useful tool, right? For example, um, and if I could split up these 10 artists into three different small cell groups and be able to let them use the two, right? What we found is at the end of the day, the artists have to use their creative judgment. I mean, this just happened a, a week ago, right? I had an artist who did a, a style frame, like a, essentially a piece of art for me, and I wasn't happy with it, right? So I put it into Mid Journey, the same piece of art, I gave a few prompts and it generated something that I feel is much stronger in terms of the perspective, the camera composition, right? And then I did, and you know, that piece of work took one week. So what I told him, the, the artist was basically, you know, um, you have to be able to use it as a tool, right? Your first sketch, if you don't feel it's strong enough, first of all, you have to exercise your judgment. This is probably not good enough for a bin, right? And then find ways. And then if you can generate three or four options, and then from there you build on, right? You, you, you know, you, you essentially half or half the time that you're working on this piece, you know, so within a week, I could actually have, he, she could have actually given me three pieces, right? Um, it still wouldn't be possible if she didn't exercise her creative judgment, her artistic eye, you know? Um, but it's also got to do with personality. So what we, and if, even in my studio, there are many artists who feel very insecure about this, and understandably so, understandably so, right? Um, so it, it is a process, but we are trying to, to uh, I mean, I'm trying to understand more myself, but also make, make sure my artists understand that this is something that, it's a, it's a different kind of animal where we, have, we want to try to, to, to kind of tame, if you like, but a lot of it is sort of meant, sort of uh, our, our mindset. And what I will always tell them is nothing we ever do with AI will, should be or will be at the expense of our creative and artistic soul, right? I think that has, still has to be. It's funny because a lot of our work is 2D, you know? Um, and I don't know, I might be wrong about this, but I have a certain theory is that something like animation, if you look at a boy and a heron, right? The film that just won the Oscar. If that was completely created by AI, I don't know if it has the same value. It almost has a value because we know someone drew, did those drawings, animated those characters. You know, I, I, I might be wrong about that. Um, my main fear about AI, frankly, is more the market side. Yeah. Meaning to say that the market will be flooded with mediocre stuff and many buyers and consumers, they do not care, right? And I think the first market to be hit would probably be the preschool market. So the children will be the one watching mediocre stuff because it activates a zombie gene, you know? And then the parents will say, just watch it, just watch it. don't disturb me, right? It's very tempting, right? It's almost like a magic power. You give the iPad, the, 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 the child shuts up, you know? <laughs> I don't have a children, so I don't know, but I, my, my sister and my friends, yeah. Um, so that's, and with that, of course, that's going to affect the market. Prices will be forced down. Yeah, but that's sort of my most immediate fear right now. Yeah. And then the tools, we just have to see how they evolve. Yeah. And uh, continually try to be on top of it in terms of the value chain. There's always somewhere you can go further up. So I think it's time for many artists to also to, to evaluate uh, uh, you know, their role how much they can, they can, they, they can grow, yeah. Thank you, wonderful. All right, second one. Yeah. <coughs> I really love how you shared this story about how you enjoyed Hayao Miyazaki, you know, writing papers of it, because I can really see that in your work and it really reflects that you're on this journey to tell a beautiful story, so um, I just want to share that with you. So my question about perspective is that, you know, um, as we journey to um, our careers and our work, uh, we, we kind of like um, get in the zone of understanding different people's perspective. And sometimes as an individual, mm. um, you may, I don't know, but for me, I, sometimes I come across that you know, someone else has a different perspective that is not in line with my way of thinking. And I just wanted to find out how do you overcome um, and 
try and understand them in a different perspective because it can be something that you are totally not agreeable with but maybe there's some truth in it and what's your journey like for that kind of situation. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's basically like conflict resolution class. Yeah, we often have, actually internal conflict is a little bit trickier for me. You know, unfortunately or fortunately, because more often than not, whether I'm the director or I'm the boss, right, um, I tend to have the final say, but that's not healthy, you know, quite often. So actually the internal conflict is, what do I take on from everyone else? How do I pick and choose, right? So the first thing I always tell my staff is when they, first of all, when we are in the, when we're discussing whether it's story or designs, you know, um, the, the, the kind of rule is there's no ego in the war room, right? Even though there is, you kind of have to suppress it, especially for me, right? Um, what I, own, the only thing I, I, I ask for from my artists is if they say this is not good, you need to give me an alternative solution to back it up, even if it's wrong. Or you, you know, so you, you essentially it's constructive criticism, right? So if you say you disagree, you need to be able to explain why and what might make it better in your view. Yeah. Otherwise, there's nowhere to go. Otherwise, you are just giving me problem and not even you have to be part of providing a solution. Usually, as a group, right? Like this character, I think she should have blonde hair. Is that why? Right, and then you know. She should, the, whoever suggested that, should be able to provide certain references from different anime, cartoons, or film, or have story reasons why they should be blonde hair or whatever. Um, I think that quite often conflict happens because there, no one else is offering the right solution or there aren't enough options on the table for us to really look at the, the problem objectively. And, you know, so we, we kind of talk ourselves into, into a dead end. Um, and then sometimes you kind of just have to walk away and take a break and then come back again. Um, like directing a film like Violinist is a big project, it's five country, right? Um, I have to make um, a, lot of, a lot of decisions, many of which I feel very insecure about, right? And should I just take someone's suggestion, is this better? Um, so I think um, ultimately, typically there should be sort of one decision maker. You know, I think so much falls on this person to, to, to exercise that right, you know, uh, uh, in the right way. So, yeah, is that anything close to keeping... I, I enjoyed your version of it. Mm. I enjoyed how you shared about, um, what was it that you said, about um, how to suppress it, because I think that's something that I'm learning as a journey. So mm. I just like that you reminded me of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe suppress is not the right word, right? Because it means um, there's something is pushing against it. You know, I think uh, it is to is to is to come down, right? And to sort of sort of open your mind up a little bit more. Yeah, because yeah, ego is a is a funny thing, right? It depends on times of day. You know, like I'm not a morning person, honestly. <laughs> I'm very grumpy in the morning. Super so vulnerable I, right now. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't have production meetings in the morning, you know, because mine is not clear. Like, I just want to get out of the room, right? Um, yeah, I think ultimately, whether it's the decision maker or anyone else, it's, you know, it's self-awareness, and that comes with, with time and experience and, and having lived some kind of a life. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you mentioned before that um, something about censorship and uh, how happy you are when uh, production uh, passes the censorship. So is that something that you have to deal with uh, regularly? Is that something that's restricting uh, the viewers, restricting the creativity? Uh, yes, in Singapore for sure. Actually anywhere else, there's, everywhere there's censorship. Even we do cartoons for Disney and and uh, Warner Brothers, they have uh, standards and practices, SMP. You know, actually they go to the US and come back. There are different levels, uh, that it, it's a different level of censorship, right? Like Mediacorp has definitely a certain kind of book that they, that they, um, they, they run the rule by, right? Uh, with downstairs, for example, I mean like Singlish, you know, it's actually a censorship issue. There cannot be too much Singlish. However, you define that, 
you know, to me it's a little absurd because it's how we talk. It doesn't mean I speak Singlish, you know, my children is going to have bad English. But that really is a very kind of, that's how, that's how they think at some level. You know, what I found interesting is um, you, you, you can't win those wars, so you don't fight them. You, know, you have to be creative to dance around the, the, the issue. And you know, the censors actually appreciate when you're being creative and dance around it. So they just turn one eye maybe. You know, so they want you to make a show, right? But they have to run, they, they have a rule, set of rules they have to go by. Um, so when it comes to a lot of the sexual innuendos, if you're clever about it, you know, sometimes I'm even surprised this, this, this went through. Um, and then with standards and practices at a more international level, it, Quite often, particularly with children's shows, it's, it's, it's to do with like, things like violence. You know, Tom and Jerry, like Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse can never be sarcastic. Yeah, because it's, uh, yeah, you can't be sarcastic. So, so sarcasm, uh, violence, or, you know, because the kids are typically 6 to 12 years old or even lower. You know? um, so at the international level, you know, they, they do have to adhere to that. Um, but it comes with experience once we have written enough or produced enough of these shows. At the end of the day, I would say they, they, they want really good and creative shows, so it, it's not really a bad thing. It just pushes the creator to, to work a little harder. Yeah, although it can be frustrating. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned with the violinists, so it's a collaboration across five countries. I'm just curious as to what role each of those countries plays. Okay, the, the basic structure is a Singapore-Spanish co-production, right? So co-production basically means when two producers or companies from different countries come together to jointly uh, finance and to creatively make uh, a TV show, a series or a feature film or anything really. It's just, it's a very common way of uh, putting projects together independently, right? In the independent world, that's usually how it does. The flip side of it is a straight commission. So a Netflix comes to you, pays you a certain amount of money to do a full show, but they, all, they will keep all the rights, right? Uh, under a co-production, the various co-producers will uh, equally share the rights based on their contribution. Right. So we set this up initially as a Singapore Spanish co-production. I have a Spanish co-director. And then we, we also brought in a Malaysia studio to help out on the animation. They might actually become another co-producer. Right. Um, so Singapore is, the animation is split between Singapore, Spain and Malaysia. Singapore actually do the, the lesser animation because we don't have a big studio. We don't even have enough animators. Right. So Singapore, we are only doing actually all the violin playing shots, you know, because that requires very specific and direct reference. Um, and then with Japan, because part of the film is in Japanese, it requires Japanese casting. Um, so I'm actually going to Tokyo next month to record the Japanese voices. So the Japanese unit handles most of that. They also pull in a little bit of investment. And then the Taiwan side will be, our composer is based in Taiwan, the one that's going to write the music, you know. So Taiwan also has quite attractive government incentives in terms of funding. So if we, if we you know, carve out some of the work to Taiwan, music as well as audio post-production, sound design, you know, they could come in to support. So all these are, are different elements that come together to make an independent project. So this is really a producer's job. I'm also a producer on a film, right? But I found that uh, this is not related to your question, but it's ultimately conflicting between a director and a producer. So I'm looking to start to let go of some of the producer's jobs. Yeah, but it's a, quite a massive operation, uh, five countries. So uh, that's how the work is split up. All right, last question. Michael. Hi, Hi, uh, hey. morning. Uh, my question is, uh, you're working with a Spanish co-director. Could you talk a little bit about the process and also about the process of adaptation as opposed to doing something original 
what do you see are the key differences and the challenges in both the areas of freedom? Something original and something adapted. Uh, my Spanish co-director, Raul, it, like how we split the work. Um, because I co-wrote the, I, it's my story, I co-wrote the script. So I think by and large, Raul gives me veto on the story. Right? Raul is, uh, he's, he's really more an animation director. I mean, he's a very, very, he's kind of almost like a, like a Hollywood legend. Right? He, he's, he's in his 60s. He's a very interesting, nice uh, Nice gentleman. He animated the genie in the Aladdin, right? And many of the what we call the uh, the Golden Age Disney animated films, Pocahontas, you know, Hercules and uh, Fantasia, right? So I brought him on really to be the animation director, you know, to really oversee the entire animation. Uh, but because of the Spanish co-production, he has to be a co-director, uh, which I'm happy to do that to share credit with him. So, I mean, basically that's how we kind of split the work, right? In the pre-production stage, we review everything, right? Um, storyboards, and then going, once you go to animation, he will be a lot more focused on animation directing, right? Um, originals and adaptation, we do both, right? Um, from a commercial standpoint, it is usually easier to, to, to adapt. So we are always on the lookout for interesting books and IPs to option to develop as well, right? Some of the projects you've just seen are option from existing literary materials. Um, just because there's already a, 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 a IP that exists in the market, right? Might be even a very popular book. So from a commercial standpoint, that makes the, the, the project easier to get finance and to take off and to find buyer, right? Um, of course, when you adapt something, the whole idea is to find a new audience for the book. It's not to please the fans of the books, right? Um, you may not want to anger them too much, but primarily they're not really the audience. The audience is a new one. It's a screen audience, right? So I think that is something always, uh, we sort of the first rule. There's, for me, there's no point adapting something so completely faithfully other than to show that it can be done technically, right? Um, and originals are, you know, they're, they're very tough. It's a very tough market for originals now across the media landscape, you know, unless you are a famous person or, or a big star. Um, yeah, I, for us, I, I see us sort of doing both, possibly at a 50-50 you know, kind of level, you know. So, yeah, I mean, good ideas are good ideas. All right, on that, uh, thank you so much, Irvin, and thank you so much for the lovely questions as well. So, a big round of applause. Thank you, again. Thank you guys. Thanks.